so thanks everyone for uh, taking the time out of your uh, evening um, and, and welcome to the inaugural Cyber Threat Intelligence User Group for, uh, for APAC. Um, really, really happy that uh, you've taken the time to, to want to join and, and uh, be part of this. Um, so what I thought we'll do is I'll give you a bit of a, uh, an introduction um, about what the group is, what, what I've, what I, why I've, I've done this and why I've set it up. Um, then we'll, we'll take you through the, um, you know, why you would want to use threat intelligence uh, with, with SEAM and, and EDR solution. Um, how you go about integrating that with, um, the, you know, using a threat intelligence platform. Um, but also uh, then, you know, what are those com uh, common deployment options data enrichment processes and setting expectations. I think that that's really important to set the right expectations for yourself and for your organization about what, um, you know, threat intelligence, what it is and, and it isn't. And then what, what you can use threat intelligence uh, beyond um, just the tactical technical outcomes for uh, with um, uh, threat intelligence. And then we'll open it up to questions, and um, I can answer any uh, any questions that you do have. So, who am I? Uh, my name's Tim Peters. Um, I go by the name if if you're on some other uh, like sec talks. Um, I'm imposter. Um, I'm a threat intelligence engineer for a company called Threat Quotient. We um, we make a product. Uh, called ThreatQ, which is a threat intelligence platform. So, really, in the uh, in the bellies of of what um, you know, managing and using threat intelligence in, in a way. So, this is not a ThreatQ demonstration or, or or discussion. This is really generic on how you can use it. So you can adapt what you learn today to use with any threat intelligence platform or using threat intelligence in your day-to-day -day, uh, operations with SEAM and EDR tools that you that you may have. I am a bit of a security nerd, um, but I am old, so I shout out clouds. Um, so yeah, I've uh, been around the, the trucks for, for a while. So uh, been there, seen that, uh, and um, have made many, 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 many mistakes uh, in that time. So I've, I've set up this user group because I want to be able to share uh, the knowledge that I've gained over the years um, with with people that are either interested in this uh, in this subject or uh, are wanting to learn. So you know, I want to share knowledge and experience to help others. Um, I want to be able to have this to learn from each other um, and you know build professional relationships in a safe and friendly environment. Um, I want to try and make this, you know, a, a once a month uh, online, and as as this grows, you know, to try and make this a um, uh, an in person uh, event. I, I travel quite quite frequently, so if you're not based in Adelaide where I am at the moment, then I'll, I want to be able to when I do um, uh, travel, and there's people in in those regions, then I, I you know love to catch up and have a drink or have something to eat together and 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 have a chat and build it up, build it from there. Um, you know, this is this is a community, so it's it's about you. Uh, so if you have a topic that you want to talk about um, that's related to cyber threat intelligence, by all means, uh, reach out to me. Uh, more than happy to uh, to to give you the platform to not only share your experiences and and share your knowledge, but also give you some um, you know practice and confidence in in um, you know presenting because. Um, it, it is it is a hard thing. Um, I still get nervous doing it. Um, I've also set up a Slack and LinkedIn group uh, so you can chat uh, and, and share that knowledge. I've also created a YouTube channel where I'll be storing the videos and a website which um, uh, will have all the where you can download the slides uh, for the uh, from the presentation tonight and upcoming presentations as such. Um, so with that said, um, are there any questions before we get started? Uh, where do you have the links for this thing? Uh, 
where can I oh, download oh, the sure. presentation? Oh, you, you'll be sending it after the meeting, is it? Yeah, yeah. You, uh, okay. I'll, 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 I have some links in there, and I'll also be sharing it through the uh, the medium. I'll, I'll do a um, a, uh, a, a a message to to all with with the link to the website, which will have everything there that you need. Great, thank you. Okay. So let's get started, you know, using uh, cyber threat intelligence with, uh, you know, your SIEM and, and your EDR tools. Um, so I think it's probably good to sort of define what different types of intelligence is because threat intelligence comes in uh, various shapes uh, and forms. Um, it's it's not just related to, to cyber, although there is now a lot of cyber elements in, in, in this. So, you know, there's human intelligence, which is, you know, gathered from interpersonal connections, uh, mainly, you know, from my perspective, you know, you would think this would be more from your uh, interrogation um, and, uh, you know, investigation, uh, you know, police, military, um, those type of things would, would be used. Cyber uh, human is more around the cyber using, you know, Techniques in, um, you know, psychological to to deceive people and and to extract information. Uh, there's signal intelligence, which is, um, you know, if you're familiar with it here in Australia, the ASD, uh, the the, um, you know, they, they intercept, um, you know, transmissions and, and signals and do all that 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 crazy stuff. Electronics, electronic intelligence, um, open source intelligence. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with the OSINT. Uh, and and how you can use OSINT for not only um, gathering information about a particular source, like finding missing persons, but also using it to when pen testing as well and uh, gathering information about an organisation that you're you're targeting as such. Um, measure and signature intelligence, but um, you know one of the fun ones is Peter intelligence. Um, and we saw this recently um, in the US, uh, and this is where it's come from. But I've got here that, um, you know, in the troop deployments in Panama and Middle East, there was lots of uh, pizzas being delivered to to the, um, you know, the Congress or, or wherever uh, that. That was seen again when they were voting in their speaker as well. There was lots of pizzas going in, so you could tell that there was lots of lots of activity happening um, in, in DC at that time. So whilst we're talking about intelligence and we want to bring that in with, um, you know, SEAM and EDR, I'll just sort of give a, a brief definition of, 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 you know, my what I believe that, you know, SEAM and, and, and EDR and what their purpose is. You know, so the SEAM's primary goal is to provide actionable security information and event log collection. Um, so that gathers all the information from lots of different sources, aggregates and, and correlates that information and gives great visibility. Um, but that's really for your internal mechanisms. Some uh, some scenes do have the ability to plug in a, um, a threat intelligence feed, so you can uh, get the best of both worlds from that. And similarly, when we look at EDR, they're, they're really focused on the endpoints. And, you, you know, EDR, MDR, XDR, you can use those interchangeably. You know, EDR is, is focused on the endpoints, like your desktops your, your, and your servers and your laptops as such. You know, XDR is the extended detection. So you're looking at your firewalls your, and your, um, uh, you know, your, your other uh, products, uh, security tools that you have out there as such. But they speak different languages. So, you know, EDR collects data from, from those endpoints, uh, looks at what the threats are and, and the behavioural uh, side of things, whereas a seam is is very log focused and and gathers and correlates, and it's it's like I've got here multi layered approach. Um, but then you've got uh, you know threat hunting, where you you can use a threat hunting, or you can use a seam and an EDR for threat hunting, um, and it's knowing how to um, leverage those particular tools. So if you're familiar with uh, products like Splunk, then you've, um, you you know how to sort of use those search queries to start looking for indicators or, um, you know, patterns that um, uh, might be, um, you know, 
prevalent in your in your organization uh, whereas EDR tools sometimes uh, I like things like CrowdStrike and your um, Sentinel ones they have their own um, automated processes to go out there now a lot of these can be in uh, integrated into SOARS uh, so security uh, automation and orchestration tools uh, to help speed up that time to efficiency and um, detection so some of the challenges that we see from a threat intelligence perspective is around the interoperability. As I said, they, they speak different languages. Um, so, you know, seems are more on the, on the log side, whereas EDR is, is on the alerts side of the fence. Um, so sometimes you can get things that are lost in translation. Um, so, and if they're, you know, these, these tools aren't from the same vendor, they could be, uh, could be talking you know, different things, or that could be overlapping and, and creating uh, a lot of noise. Um, you know, sometimes there's ownership there for a lot. You know, this is especially in larger organisations where we see that this, the SEAM is managed by one group of people. The EDR is managed by another group. Threat intelligence is another group that's on its own as well. So, um, and sometimes those teams don't talk to each other. So they're, they're not collaborating in there. And that's, you know, it comes down to, you know, threat intelligence when you're starting looking at, if you're looking at a single source, that's okay. But when you start to look at multiple sources, whether they be commercial uh, intelligence feeds, open source intelligence feeds, you start to get a lot of noise because there's overlap in there. So if it's not centrally managed, you can get a lot of uh, alerts going off if you're pumping multiple um, intelligence feeds into these platforms that are, aren't managing it and deduplicating those those particular um, feeds that are coming in. So why, you know, what we're trying to do is, is you know, use threat intelligence um, to bring out a, um, you know, to, to, to generate an outcome. And the outcome is to get it to work in its in a way that it's complementary to the existing tools that you have. Um, so it's not a replacement for any tools. It's really about uh, complementing and bringing the detection, improving your, your detection rate by using what security researchers are out there and, and from those threat intelligence feeds are, are building what's been seen out in the wild and bringing that in and um, and sending it across to the security tools that you have to see if they have been cited uh, within your uh, within your environment. So we see here that we've got you know threat intelligence, but we, we're you know, we're moving those um, that that seam is collecting logs from all over the place from from within your organisation, um, and it's picking up on you know behaviours, but it may not know that a particular IP address that it's communicating to just so happens to be bad. And so you would use threat intelligence to, to um, communicate and send bi-directional uh, communication to say, hey, Mr. Seam, have you um, have you seen uh, this particular IP, uh, anybody communicating with this IP address? It could be command and control server. Um, and, um, you know, if the Seam comes back and says, yes, I have seen uh, a, you know, a particular device or devices uh, or or systems talking, then you want to create an alert, and that's where the power of using threat intelligence can can improve that detection um, times. Same goes with an EDR tool. If you've seen a particular hash, you can go off and say, "Excuse me, Miss uh, Miss EDR, have you seen um, this particular hash any anywhere on on any of these uh, devices?" And then and come back and say yes or no that it haven't. If it has, then you can use um, you know, different techniques to um, go and recover. Um, so that's um, and respond to that uh, particular incident. And same with, with the same. But then you've also got uh, looking at what that context of that information from threat intelligence brings. And you can automate all of that. You can use things like sandbox to bring in, in you know, what we what I would call internal intelligence. So only things that are uh, your organization has only seen. Um, you can then use the, your threat hunting tools, or in in um, for you know large organizations, you could uh, 
engage your red team or your threat hunters to go and search for particular indicators that an adversary may be using. So, um, you know, with th a threat intelligence platform, you're gathering all the information about a particular adversary, uh, what the technique, uh, you know, you probably heard of the, the term uh, tactics, techniques and procedures, um, the MITRE attack um, framework. Um, you can then use those to say, okay, how vulnerable are we to a particular type of attack from this particular type of adversary? Um, we can bring in our asset management data and we bring in our, um, you know, uh, vulnerability scanning. We can then share that information with other organisations. We can anonymise it and share it with, with other organisations to let them know. So it becomes a two-way platform and becomes that, that central bridge between all your downstream security tools, but also with your stakeholders. Um, and you can give a more accurate and a better assessment on what the potential risks are uh, to your organization. So why would you use a, a, a you know, threat intelligence platform and threat, threat, uh, cyber threat intelligence uh, with the SEMA and EDR? And as I mentioned, you get, you get improved threat detection, you get a more uh, effective incident response because you can act upon that as quickly as possible. Um, you can share that information with other organisations. Um, so for those that are familiar with the, um, the federal government's uh, CTIS program, uh, whilst they share information with um, organisations, you can share back as well to let other people um, that use that platform uh, to alert them on what, um, what, what is happening. You know, you may have been subject to a, a particular type of attack, you've gathered some indicators and you can send them off to, um, you know, so others can take advantage of that. You know, threat intelligence with a, um, you know, a user-driven scoring approach. And, and what I mean by that is that you want to be, um, you, you want to be able to determine a particular indicator that's come in, how, you know, is it good, bad or indifferent? Um, mostly they're going to be bad, but how bad on that scale? So is it something that you need to worry about now? Or, you know, is it something that you need to worry, that, that you can worry about later on, um, you know, after you've gone through your high priority? So being able to adjust and, and score and how you score that for your organisation is really impossible. It's really important because you can reduce the false positives um, and that also with, with a threat intelligence platform, you're also uh, deduplicating a lot of those um, uh, indicators that are coming in that you're sending to your SEAM and EDR because um, you could be getting the same IP address from multiple sources. And so you only want to send it once, not multiple times, uh, because you don't want to be um, getting, uh, you know, woken up in the middle of the night every night. Uh, enhanced threat hunting, you know, using the um, the tactics, techniques and procedures to go and look for um, particular indicators, um, seeing what, what they use, the tools that they use, um, see, you know, any of the command and control servers they're using uh, and so forth. But one of the most important ones is improving collaboration. You want to be able to collaborate with the other teams if you're in a large organisation where you are um you know somewhat siloed in, in in a lot of cases you want to be able to collaborate and share and say hey this is what we've seen um has this been uh, have you know has there seen seen this uh, particular ip url um hash or whatever same goes for the edr as well and then using it for to to automate that process because you want to um whilst sending indicators to um, to seems you know, what we would call atomic indicators, where uh, you know your basic you know, URLs, IPs, and, and, and hashes as such, um, you know that that can be a bit bit tedious after you know the you know eleven hundredth uh, indicator that you're going through. Not all um, uh, indicators can be sent to uh, to to these platforms. They you don't want to overwhelm them either, so you want to send a curated uh, list. But you can automate that through uh, through processes as well. So it's important to 
automate as uh, much of the, those tasks that are um, you know uh, that you that you do on a daily basis that can be automated, so you can focus on more strategic threat intelligence, like looking at uh, the adversary and looking at how they approach uh, approach things. So some of the common common deployment models um, that that we that you have when integrating you know threat intelligence platform um, to your SIEM and your EDR. The most common way is through uh, API integration. If you look at products like Splunk and um, QRadar and and um, and the likes, they all have um, you know I know you know for the Splunk base they have the um, a lot of the threat intelligence platforms integration in, in as part of the the Splunk base where you can download and install that uh, on there. But there's also the taxi um, server uh, to to push out or to um, to pull uh, data to and from. So those two two models are available. API integration is probably um, you know the most most common these days. Taxi, whilst it's still relevant, the, um, you know there's a lot more people developing for uh, via API. When you do get uh, from from your threat intelligence um, platform and and all the sources that you're bringing in commercial and open source threat intelligence, you want to be able to enrich that data, but you don't want to be sending everything off to, um, you know, Virus Total or Shodan or, or any of the other types of uh, enrichment tools that are out there. Um, you want to be able to set a baseline. So, for example, with Virus Total, you want to be able to enrich the data and say, okay, well, if I see that, you know, twenty of the AV engines that scan this particular file or this particular um, IP uh, come back and say that it's malicious. I want to flag that and say, okay, this is important um, because 20 of them have um, been, uh, ha have said it's malicious. I want to immediately send that um, to, to the same, to the EDR to see if it's been cited anywhere. Um, so you want to set that baseline uh, from there. And then you want to use that with that, as I talked about scoring to say, okay, these are the most important things that I need to worry about right now. Um, and you want to be able to score on different options, like, you know, not just the indicator, but on the sources. How confident are you on that source that's coming in? Um, you know, open source um, threat intel feeds uh, are good, but they can be very, very noisy. Um, the commercial threat intelligence feeds are very good. They have high confidence, um, but you know, you want to be able to say, okay, when I see something from a, um, a commercial threat intelligence feed, I want to give that a higher score. Uh, if I see it from an open source one, I'm going to give it a little bit of a lower score. But then I also want to be able to um, score that against some of the contextual information that comes with um, those feeds. So, you know, is there has there been a... Uh, you know, is is a the command and control active? Is that um, you know, is it you know being flagged as malicious? As you, when I talked about the virus total, if it's seen on twenty more, we want to flag that, give that a dis different score. But also, we want to be able to say, okay, if I've seen a particular threat actor um, or adversary that um, that is potentially that targets our industry. Um, then we want to pay a closer attention to that. So if we do see something from them, we want to give that additional score. So we start on accumulating those scores. So we know that if we do see something in our um, platform that has a really high score, we want to immediately send that across to our SIEM and EDR to see if it's been cited. Then we may want to send that off to our, ex, uh, to our, um, our firewalls as well. So when we go into that XDR uh, discussion, you know, we want to start looking at those, you know, our web proxies, our uh, email gateways, our um, you know, firewalls, depending, you know, how, how you've got that set up. You want to be able to send and say, okay, this is this looks pretty bad. I want to proactively put some blocks in place to, to help. And then if our SIEM and EDR do detect those, then we've got our plan to get ready um, uh, to, to respond to that. So, you know, 
whilst you might want to do manual enrichment of, of data and, and that for very specific use cases, you want to automate as much as possible. Um, it, it takes you know too long to go and automate uh, to to go and manually go and copy and paste into virus total and things like that. So you want to do that as, as uh, get that automatic as possible. Things like a SOAR platform can can do that as well, um, and it can feed back into your threat intelligence platform as well. Um, when we talk about setting the right expectations, you know we want to talk about the quality of those feeds that are coming in. So you know looking at those feeds that we're using, something like um, you know the CTIS platform, they have you know high confidence, you know, low volume. Um, they're the sort of things that you want to bring in. You don't want to bring in high volume, low confidence type feeds but that are going to either trigger um, uh, false positives or start uh, blocking, as I've seen in some uh, open source threat intelligence feeds that are there, you know, block google.com or, or, or things like that, where it starts to um, impact on productivity. You know, as the saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. Um, so, you know, you're always maintaining and, and manage your threat intelligence data that's coming in and remove feeds that that may not be providing, um, you know, value to, to your organisation. Um, and then, you know, when we talk about effectiveness, this is not a silver bullet. It's, it's, a, it, it's another, uh, you know, layer of the onion or another way of co complementing the existing security tools that you have in place to help understand what is going on uh, and give you the context. Um, and you use it as a way to collaboratively work with your other teams uh, or in some cases, um, you know, giving you, if you're the only person or a small team, giving yourselves the, the context of what a particular threat actor is doing with these particular, um, you know, indicators as such, um, how they're using them, what are the tools that they're using. So you can start to build a more effective um, plan against respo you know, responding or protecting your organisation. So one of the things I'm, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with is the, the pyramid of pain. Um, and as we look at the, the pain, we've got the you know, hash values, IP addresses, domain names, you know, uh, network and host artifacts. They're all indicator based. So they're pretty much what you're sending to your, your seam um, and what your seam is collecting as well. And what you're doing is matching those to see if there's any any signs of, of uh, indicators of compromise. Um, so, you know, your scene gives you that visibility. Uh, your threat intelligence gives you the context. Um, when you move up into your tools, like um, your, uh, the, the tools and, 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 and tactics that they're that using, you've got your, your EDR tools, your XDR tools and things like that. Um, they can be more challenging because they start to look at behavioral base and depending on how that threat actor um, goes about doing their work. Um, they can bypass a lot of tools as such. Um, so that can be very challenging. But then focusing really on behavioral-based detectors. This is where you want to be spending your time as a, uh, you know, a threat intel, uh, intel analyst um, is looking and understanding about what, a, uh, what an adversary is doing. Um, Everything here in the IOC-based detection can be automated um, using either uh, your existing SIEM tools and EDR tools with threat intelligence plugged in or using a threat intelligence platform and then uh, bi-directional communication with those SIEMs and EDR tools. Um, where you want to be starting as a threat intel analyst to spend more most of your time is looking around the tools, looking around the, um, the, the TTPs um, that are being used. So as I talked about, you know, beyond tactical cyber threat intelligence, you know, it, it's more than just indicators. You really want to understand the what, how and why of an adversary and determine the risk to your organisation. Um, you know, how, they, uh, how an adversary mounts an attack um, is, is quite well documented in not only um, reports that come in from your commercial uh, feed vendors, 
um, but also from open source blogs and things like that. Um, but it gives you the context of, of um, you know, the, the how and uh, the what and how. The why might be difficult to determine um, because you don't know why they, they may be targeting a particular organisation. Um, you're just basing it on previous um, uh, you know, reports and things like that. So spending that time and learning about how an adversary goes about their business um, is, is really important. Um, you know, analyze and track those specific adversaries to preempt their next move. So if you're looking at a particular adversary and saying, okay, they are targeting at the moment, um, you know, the financial uh, institutions, they are, they've moved from targeting Europe uh, based on some of the reports, They've uh, attacked uh, the the US. Now they're coming into the um, into Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific. You know, what are you likely to be a target? So you can then preempt their next move and say, okay, we need to be on heightened alert. Um, and this is where you can then engage um, and see how vulnerable is your organisation to to a uh, specific adversaries. Um, TTPs. So, you know, could you sustain an attack from them? And so by using the above of, of understanding the what, how, and the why, and, and tracking them to preempt their, their moves, and then proactively going and seeing how vulnerable your organization may be, you can uh, be able to say, okay, these controls that we do have in place um, are, are enough to sustain these type of, of TTPs. TPs, but we still are going to, we're not going to say we are, you know, fully protected, but we're going to have a lot more confidence in our abilities to be able to uh, protect our organisation and, and um, you know, uh, sustain an attack from these particular adversaries. Um, they might just try, uh, be unsuccessful and then move on to another organisation. But if you've then shared that information with other uh, organisations within your sector, with your peers, then they'll be able to implement those things as well. So with that, are there any questions? All make sense? Actually, Tim, I have a question. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, earlier you spoke about um, API integration becoming more used these days. Uh, could you explain a bit more about why? Well, with the API integration, um, you can do a lot more depending on the, on, on the platform. So with, with an API, you've got a lot more flexibility on what you want to be able to do. Um, when compared to a sort of a taxi, you, you're just sending this, the data across. It's just the mechanism to, to send the data. Whereas with the API, you can actually say, oh, you know, I want to be able to do this and want it in this format. I want to be able to do certain things in there. So it becomes a lot oh, more okay. attractive from that perspective because yeah. you can then do a lot more. Brilliant. Does Thank you very sense? much. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Any other um, questions? Hey, Tim, just a quick question. So my understanding here could be wrong, but uh, I need your uh, uh, inputs here. So I think you spoke about uh, the behavior detections. So I think IDS does the behavior detections, wherein IPS does the uh, uh, knowledge-based detections. So, um, sorry, it's the other way around, sorry. The IDS does the uh, knowledge-based detections wherein someone has to go and update uh, the signatures manually, the attack signatures, mm -hmm. uh, wherein IPS does the uh, knowledge-based detections. So can we use both IPS and IDS together to reduce the threat impact? Yeah, definitely. Um, so you can send the IPS. So uh, the example that I'm familiar with is using um, a tipping point. Um, and so you can send tipping point um, indicators to not only look for those, but then say, okay, we want to create a rule. If we do see these particular indicators through from the IDS, the IPS will kick in and say, block these 
this type of behavior type uh, block this type of uh, uh, you know attack based around that's so using things like Yara rules and signatures and things like that. So so yes, a threat intelligence platform has the capability to to um, send those messages across to say, hey, if we do see this, then your um, your you know, in this case from from my uh, you know knowledge of it you know, with tipping point is to go and proactively uh, block that from occurring. Oh, okay. So uh, wouldn't there be any overlap between IDS and IPS if we use them together? So from the logs perspective? So uh, IDS is, is it, uh, you know, tr- you know I'll, I'll go back, you know, because I'm old, um, you know, signature-based. It knows what to do. But, it do- you know, they have evolved and they're looking at behavioural types of, um, of patterns um with with threat intelligence if you're sending it indicators you're generally sending it saying if you see from these particular ip addresses or if you see these urls if you see these particular um hashes and things like that that's your ids when you're looking at your um ips where it's it's putting in the the, the prevention the 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 blocking that can then start to use, um, you know, again, more of the behavioural based. So you could then say these particular um, Yara rules that we we want to send across to it will be able to um, proactively or, or the snort rules and things like that to to go and um, you know block that priority these these behaviour or these these patterns that we're we're looking at. Yep, makes sense. Thanks, thanks, John. Any other questions? Hey, Tim. Um, it's not necessarily a question, but probably um, a real-world example. Um, so obviously in recent news there's been the 3CX hack where, you know, credential smuggling was happening. Um, now, obviously having a CTI feed fit into your CD, uh, your SIEM and your XDR, you know, Sentinel-1 and I believe PowerStrike both detected them earlier as... Well, you could almost say that people were saying it was a false positive. But obviously, if you yeah. have your CTI feed coming in as well and seeing that the commander control that it was smuggling the credentials out to, plus interacting with your next-gen firewall or your WAF, and then having a feed that, that is both a push-pull, that can actually enable detection of a more global threat, like, for example, a 3CX hack, where... Uh, ultimately sharing that feed is beneficial for the community in general. But at the same time, it should be able to then map against TTPs and understand that, oh, you know, this is happening. It's going to a command and control center that's known um, through the CTI and the and uh, the IP addresses and things like that. And then you go, oh, actually, one of their secondary tactics is a secondary payload. So it actually does implement or start to distribute that that information more broadly to the community doesn't it yes it does yeah so it, it becomes all sometimes it's a it's a case of chicken and uh, you know chicken or the egg um because a lot of the times these um like your your sentinel one and your CrowdStrike, which really were on top of this they were then sharing that through they they discovered those their, their researchers uncovered a, a lot of that and then shared that information with the the community which was then fed into feeds which was then enable other organizations that may not be using those particular products or tools uh, to um, gain visibility about what uh, about those type of uh, uh, techniques and and um, tools and that 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 were being used so yeah for, from a sharing uh, community it sometimes goes via that that vendors because they're seeing it first but then other times you've got your security researchers there that are you know scouring the the dark web uh join these you know impersonating um you know particular uh, or part of groups and they're saying okay we're seeing that this particular uh, adversary is going to target say for example 3cx in, in um, as an example um and then they will share that information, which then goes back down the channels in in the same way. So you become more heightened alert to those sort of things. So being able to share that information both 
from a commercial aspect as well as a open source perspective is really important for the entire security community and sharing that information. The other aspect, I guess, that comes with that is not just the, I guess, the, the, the quick detection, but because they've known that it's, oh, this particular adversary, because they've been able to identify, always uses, or 99% of the time uses a secondary payload, um, mm -hmm. then the seams in the, well, not the seams, sorry, the XDR could actually be automatically given the error rule to go, okay, we've seen this behavior, automatically apply this rule because we know that 90% of the time it happens. And then obviously, yes. you know, that that then uh, foothold that they gain um, obviously becomes a new issue after that point. Whereas, you yeah. know, until we actually determine, you know, a week later that, oh, there's a secondary payload and then all of a sudden we realise, crap, they own their network. Um, so obviously that feed and, and everything is important for almost a proactive approach as well. Yeah, yeah, very much so. I mean, we're so under-resourced as, as, as security professionals um, that we, we struggle to, to do the, uh, you know, do everything in, in the time that we have. Um, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day and, you know, with the amount of work that we do have, it, it's, it's taking, you know, 60, 70 hours to, in, that we need. But um, being able to automate that those processes like you discussed, is um, a, you know a key way to free up that time to focus on looking at for those secondary payloads uh, that may not be detected. So actively threat hunting uh, in the environment, um, actively looking for additional indicators. Um, you, know, you, you you automate the um, the, the mundane tasks and, and focus on the really cool stuff. Yeah, definitely get that. Yeah, okay, cool. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Well, look, um, you know, like I said, this is a this is a community is about you. Um, so if you do have a uh, you know CTI related topic um, that you want to present, um, you know, please. Let me know if you're interested. Um, more than happy to to give you the the, the platform to to um, you know present your on your topic that you're passionate about. Um, you know, it can be as simple as how you got into the industry or how how um, you've gotten into threat intel and and what you what you like about it. Or it can be, um, you know, this is this is what we found when I did. You know, we were doing an investigation as such. Um, so if you do have uh, something that you want to present, by all means, uh, let me know. Um, I've got some multiple ways of um, getting us together. Um, so I've set up a, a website called cti-users-group.org. So that's going to have all of the, um, the links to the videos and to the slides as well. Um, I've created a Slack group, um, you know, called CTI-users-group at Slack. So feel free to, um, you know, join that, or I do have a LinkedIn uh, one uh, as well. Um, there's a YouTube channel as well, um, which is, um, you know, immediately named CTI-users-group. Um, and then also, uh, you know, email what I'll do is on the on the meetup, I'll send out a, um, a message with the website, and you'll be able to go to the website to to see that. Um, and I'll just bring that up here. It's very basic. Um, I'm not a web developer by any stretch of the imagination. I'll put upcoming events here. With the link to to meetup uh, you also get it in meetup as well um, in the presentations i'll be adding in the slide and then on the video which will be linked to to youtube as well and you'll be able to go and watch that at a later date uh, if it's something that interests you or grab the grab the slides uh, from there um, on the home page down the bottom we've i've got all the links to slack linkedin YouTube meetup and, and email as well. So yeah, 
Um, if there's no other questions, happy to hang around and have a chat. Um, yeah, otherwise, thank you very much for uh, joining me on this uh, inaugural uh, session. And I hope to see you on the next one. Thank you, Tim. Right, thank it's been you. Good.